Welcome to lecture 15 of Ancient Philosophy. I hope you all are enjoying this course. Today we're going to discuss Aristotle on change. Now Aristotle thinks that nature is an internal principle of change. So we've seen in the last lecture how Aristotle understands the distinction between form and matter and how form is a metaphysically basic striving that exists in nature. And so when we turn to look at Aristotle's understanding of change, we're going to see how this works out. Let's go ahead and get started. Let's go ahead and jump into Aristotle's response to Parmentides. So we saw, remember, in our opening lecture that Parmentides denies the reality of change. Parmentides had, as his most famous disciple, Zeno, and Zeno gives us these famous paradoxes of motion. Now, Parmentides' challenge is a skeptical challenge. It's to show us that even though sense experience presents us with a world of change, when we try to understand change, we can see that change is impossible. And so the use of reason, the use of our understanding, shows us that reality is not as we take it to be. So Aristotle begins in the Physics, Book 1, Chapter 8, to describe Parmentides' challenge. So he says, they claimed, they speaking of Parmentides and his disciples, they claim that nothing comes to be or ceases to be. So here the idea again is change is unreal. And they argued like this, Aristotle says, for one, anything that comes to be must come from what is or from what is not. Seems reasonable. If something comes to exist, it either comes to exist from something that exists or something that doesn't exist. But then, Parmentides and others reason, what is can't come to be because it already is. And three, nothing can come to be from what is not, because after all, from nothing you get nothing. So this is the challenge for Aristotle and for those who defend common sense that we can see change around us. Aristotle thinks that we should accept the reality of change and figure out how it is possible. So there's a passage I want to look at at 193a6. Aristotle here is giving his methodology. He says to rely on the non-obvious, to establish the obvious, is a sign of being incapable of distinguishing between what is and what is not intelligible in itself. So Aristotle is known for his idea that we begin with common sense and that we look to philosophy to clarify common sense, to give us a deeper understanding of why our beliefs are true. We can see how this strategy is applied by looking at a passage in, in Physics Book 8, Chapter 3. So here, this is around 252A32 and following. So he's discussing some of the challenges. He says, first, the idea that everything is at rest, talking about Parmentides' challenge. For people to ignore the evidence of their senses and look for an explanation for everything being at rest is feeble-minded. It engages the issue at a general level rather than disputing particulars. Also, it is hardly an exaggeration to say that the claim affects not just natural science, but every branch of knowledge there is, and all received opinions too, since none of them would exist without change. Besides, just as in mathematical discussions, objections about principles are not the province of a mathematician, and the same goes for other sciences too, so also the objection we are currently considering is not the province of a natural scientist for whom it is a basic assumption that nature is a principle of change. So Aristotle is going to accept that the senses give us, reveal to us, the senses make evident to us that we live in a world of change. And the goal of inquiry is to understand how that's possible. Now Aristotle also has another methodological principle is that when you consider an argument, look for the truth in the opposing view. So when he discusses Parmentides' challenge, he's going to find where he and Parmentides agree. So in Greek, we have here this principle that from nothing, nothing comes. Uden hex udenas. From nothing, nothing will result. Now he, Aristotle and Parmentides, agree about this. They think that Premise 3, for example, is true, that nothing can come about from what is not. Behind their agreement is a deeper agreement about what is known as the principle of sufficient reason. This is a principle that says any contingent event that occurs has an explanation. There is a cause for that particular event. And so both Parmentides and Aristotle agree 
that if there is change, we should be able to understand change. Okay, so how does Aristotle respond to Parmentides? Of course, there is the methodological point that the senses make evident to us that there's a world of change, but that doesn't give us an understanding of how change is possible. So in Aristotle's view, change requires a blend of reality and unreality. That is to say that for any change, there must always be something real behind the change. There, all, there must always be a subject that exists prior to, during, and after the change. So consider, for example, a person who starts off not being able to play the guitar. Here we have a picture of Jason Isbell, who in my judgment is one of the best working singer-songwriters. We can imagine someone, much like myself, who at one point in time did not know how to play the guitar. And then through years of practice, rather long sessions of practice, I became musical. I developed this ability to play the guitar. Now we can think of this in a way that makes change seem mysterious. We could think of this in a sense of a non-musical being becoming a musical being. Or in sense two that we have here on the handout that the non-musical becomes musical. And then that seems to violate this principle of sufficient reason because we don't understand how something that is not can become something that is. So for Aristotle, it's important to realize that that's only one way to describe what's going on. There's another way of describing what's going on, and this is to say that the man becomes musical. That there was a subject that was not musical. That subject went through a process of becoming musical, and then that subject continues to exist after they're musical. There is a substance there that continues to exist throughout the change. Now we need a little more theoretical understanding to, to ground this judgment. Now Aristotle's theory of actuality and potentiality helps to make sense of how this change is possible. After all, if we just describe a subject that endures throughout and that at one point doesn't have a property and then comes to have a property, we still don't understand how that is possible. That's still can seem to violate the principle of sufficient reason. So Aristotle here invokes his distinction between potentiality and actuality and applies it to this case of change. So what is important is that the man who is becoming musical, or the man, let, let's step back and say, the man who is not musical has the potentiality to become musical. Now that potentiality is a form. There's a form, a striving within the individual that exists. Remember, the form is not something that you're, you can see in the matter if you just have, you know, a powerful enough microscope. The form is a metaphysically basic feature of the person that, in a sense, is added to the matter. But that potentiality, that form, exists. It's real. It is within the person. And what happens is that potentiality is activated. And then it becomes an act of striving. It's striving to learn to become musical. And then once that potentiality has been actualized, it now exists as no longer as a striving, but as a real actualized form within the individual. So Aristotle says change is the actuality of that which exists potentially. Now it's really important to realize here that we're not talking about mere possibilities when we talk about potentialities. We're not saying like, oh, well, that person has a, the possibility of becoming a musician. After all, that's not enough for Aristotle. That person has the potentiality. And when we say has, we very much mean the sense of has as if you would say that person has two ears or that person has two legs. They're features of the person. But the potentiality is not an observable feature of the person. So we can isolate some consequences of Aristotle's understanding of change. The first consequence is that change is fundamentally directional to a goal, to a telos, to an end. Telos is just the Greek word here for end or goal. So when we understand a person becoming musical, they're undergoing a change, that change is directed to the actualization, the actual state of being musical. 
So this feature leads naturally to the second consequence is that you're not going to understand a change until you understand the goal or the telos. So this is why it's very important in the study of nature, in the study of reality, to think about the teleology that's inherent in nature on Aristotle's view and to try to grasp what that teleology is, what that goal is, so that we can understand the changes that are occurring. The third feature is that everything that changes, changes by a distinct cause of change. So that for Aristotle, for change to occur, there's a potentiality. And that potentiality can lay dormant for a long time. There has to be something that actualizes that potentiality. And so by a principle of sufficient reason, we are required to find an, an entity that actualizes the potentiality. Now, in the cases of natural organisms, that activation of a potentiality is by the father and, and the mother. So, for example, when two animals produce an offspring, that offspring has the potentiality, which is the striving to grow into a mature adult of its species. And that, act, that potentiality is activated by the transfer of the form from the parents to the child. So the primary case for Aristotle for this is the analogy with artifacts. So we have wood, right? That wood has the potentiality of becoming a house, but that potentiality, right, requires a builder. The builder has within themselves this form that is activated through the wood and through their process that results in a house. So the changer introduces a form here. There's another feature of Aristotle's view of change that I want to highlight because of its role in the history of philosophy. What causes the change and what is the subject of the change are one and the same. So the descriptions, the builder building, and the house being built pick out the same entity, pick out the same actualization of a potentiality as striving. So the object of change, what is causing the change, is the builder building. And what is the subject of change is the house being built. But from Aristotle's perspective, metaphysically, those are one and the same. So the craftsman plying his craft and the creation of the crafted item are one and the same. What this means is that there's no alienation from the worker, from his product. We can see this principle in Hegel's master-slave dialectic. In this dialectic, there is a life and death struggle between two agents, each demanding recognition from the other. To escape death, the vanquished agent opts for enslavement to his newly created master. Ironically, the slave triumphs through hard work. Although his toil is supposedly in the service of his master, and thus alienated and forced. In fact, in his work, he objectifies his soul because the builder building and the house being built are one and the same activity. The slave finds in his toil an outer expression of his inner soul. Now, Hegel intends this as a criticism of Aristotle's view here that what causes the change and the subject of the change are one and the same. Now, Marx picks up Hegel's analogy here, and he thinks that the industrial worker does not achieve the same triumph under the capitalist system as Hegel's slave does under his mythical master. In Marx's world, it is labor that gives value to things. Therefore, if the capitalist employer is to make a profit, a significant portion of a laborer's life and energy must be alienated from him. The value which the laborer pours into his creation by his own toil must be the property of the capitalist, if capitalism is to work. Because the builder building is the same activity as the house being built, the capitalist laborer is alienated from himself in his work. The house being built is not merely something he brings about, it is his labor objectified. Since a laborer in a capitalist society is essentially that, by being alienated from his own labor, he is alienated from what he most fundamentally is. Again, here in Marx's criticism of capitalism, we see an Aristotelian principle about the relation of a craftsman's soul to the artifacts. 
he produces. Okay, so let's turn to understand Aristotle's views of space. Aristotle thinks that change occurs in space and time, and so to get a fuller understanding of change, we need to understand space and time. Now, if I have some time later in the week, I want to put up a lecture on Aristotle's view of time. It's super fascinating, but it's going to require a lot more work. So, to understand space or magnitude, we need to understand the notion of infinite divisibility. So, in Aristotle's view, in order to understand magnitude, you need to understand the idea of infinite divisibility. Aristotle thinks that space magnitudes are only potentially infinite. He thinks that we can always divide a magnitude but that we're finite beings, and so we can't actually divide a magnitude an infinite number of times. But because space or magnitudes themselves are potentially infinite, we can always divide a little bit more. So we can think if we have a half, we can divide that half, and if we have a fourth, we can divide that fourth, and so on. So that for any segment that's left for any magnitude that we have we can always divide it in half but that there's no actual process that carries out an infinite division and so magnitudes are not actually infinitely divisible they're only potentially infinitely divisible so this is then applied to Aristotle's response to one of Zeno's paradoxes of motion so recall Zeno argued that motion is impossible because if you're traveling along a line from point A to point B you need to go halfway first, and then you need to go half of the remaining distance, and you need to go half of the remaining distance, and you need to go half of that distance, and you never actually get to the end. Or you could do it the other way, so that you start off and you think, okay, well, in order to get to point B, I have to go half of that distance. But in order to get to the midpoint, I have to go half of, the, of that point, and then I have to go half of that point, and half of that point, and half of that point. So you can never get started on your journey. So Aristotle argues that the problem with this argument is that there aren't an infinite number of points on a line. So Zeno is thinking that there's a halfway point, there's a point that's half of the halfway point, there's a point that's half of that point, there's a point that's half of that point, and so on. And so if you carry out that process, that would require an infinite number of points. Aristotle thinks, remember, that a magnitude is only potentially infinitely divisible. And so, right, there's only going to be a potentially infinite number of points. He would think that there would be an infinite number of actual points on the line if there was an infinite process. That is, if a person or a process could stop at every point on a line. But he says that's impossible. You can't have an actual infinite process that's completed within a finite time. So his response to Zeno here is to argue that motion is possible because there aren't an infinite number of points on the line. So you can continuously move from point A to point B. But he grants the truth in Zeno's thought here is that what's called a staccato run from A to B is impossible. So a staccato run would be where you run from point A to point B in, say, two minutes. And in the first 30 seconds, you run half of the way, and then you rest for 30 seconds. And then the next 15 seconds, you run a quarter of the way and rest for 15 seconds. And then you run an eighth of the way and rest for half of that, and so on and so forth. And so in order to complete the run, you would have to stop at an infinite number of points. And Aristotle thinks that's impossible. You'll never make it to the destination. Okay, so I hope that's a helpful guide to our reading to today. Remember, we're reading Physics, Book 1, Chapters 7 to 8, and Physics, Book 3, Chapters 1 through 8. Hopefully, I'll have some more time later in the week, and I'll be able to put up a lecture on Aristotle's view on time, which is super fascinating. And then, you know, if I have a little more time in that lecture, I can explain in more detail Aristotle's response to another puzzle from Zeno. So I hope you guys are enjoying this, and I hope you have a good